Hey everyone and welcome to our first video of Unit 3 in our Ace Marine Science Curriculum. This unit is going to deal with energetics of marine ecosystems, but in this video, uh, the part one, we're going to primarily focus on the processes of photosynthesis and chemosynthesis and then talk about this term of uh, what productivity is. So you might remember from our previous unit that when we talk about energy flow through ecosystems, it flows through different trophic levels. We're always going to start with our source of energy, which will be captured by our first trophic level, which we call producers, and then from there it's going to move to our second trophic level, our primary consumers, then to our secondary, and then finally to our tertiary consumers. What we're going to primarily focus though on here is this first step here, which is how do we get our source of energy captured into organisms uh, through the process of either photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. So we're going to have two less than, essential, uh, less than essential questions today. First is how does photosynthesis and chemosynthesis, how do they make energy available to the food chain? Now I underline those terms because those are terms you should be able to explain and describe by the end and really understand how do they capture energy for the rest of the ecosystem. And then finally we'll talk about the term productivity. Again, something I underlined, you should be able to explain that term and understand how does productivity affect uh, the rest of the food chain. Now, before we can talk about photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, I wanted to review a term uh, that you're going to hear me say, and that's organic compound. What exactly is an organic compound? Well, if you've taken biology before, you might be familiar with biological molecules, things like carbohydrates, which are going to be usually our source of energy, whether it's a simple sugar like glucose or a complex carbohydrate like starch or cellulose. We could talk about things like proteins, which are going to give us all of our traits, or we have our nucleic acids, which is our uh, RNA and DNA, which is our genetic information, or then we have our lipids, which are fats, oils, and waxes. And you might remember that these things are essential for life. We can't live without them. They are considered organic, and what makes them organic is you notice they all have tons of these black atoms here, which are going to be carbon atoms. So organic compounds are going to be molecules that contain carbon, and in addition to that, they're also going to have these white guys here, which are our hydrogen atoms hanging off of them. Now, they can contain other things like oxygen and nitrogen, but organic compounds are going to be molecules that use carbon and hydrogen are, and are essential for life. Living things depend on those organic molecules. Now, where do we get our organic compounds from? We are heterotrophs, so we have to eat them. We get them from other organisms. But where did uh, they originate from? Where did those organic compounds come from? That's really the job of producers, is they capture energy from a source and then fix that energy into organic compounds for the rest of the food chain. So photosynthesis, this is something that I'm sure you're familiar with by now, we're going to have a group of organisms of producers, whether they're plants or some bacteria or some protists, but organisms that are typically the green guys, and they're going to capture light energy. They're going to use that as their energy source. They're also going to take in inorganic things, things like carbon dioxide and water. These are not organic, and they're going to use those ingredients to produce our organic compounds. In, a, uh, in the process too, thankfully, they also release oxygen. So this is a a formula that I'm sure you're, you have memorized by now, but they're going to use carbon dioxide, water, and then light energy, that's the energy source, and they're going to use that to create something like glucose, C6H12O6, and then oxygen. So again, they're using that light energy, capturing it, and putting it into these organic compounds like carbohydrates. Now, down deep in the oceans where light is not available, so these aphotic zones, there are hydrothermal vents, these underwater volcanoes, that also uh, some sort of production can happen. So our producers here are going to be chemosynthetic bacteria. And these chemosynthetic bacteria, again, are not using light energy. They instead are going to use chemical energy. So spewing out of these hydrothermal vents are going to be uh, molecules and uh, inorganic things that contain lots of energy stored in them that these bacteria can use to fix them into organic compounds. So again, they're going to take in carbon in the form of carbon dioxide, and they're going to use that chemical energy to produce those organic compounds. Now, chemosynthesis is not as uh, simple as photosynthesis in terms of a formula. There's not just one. There's plenty out there. Just to name a couple, though, that you should be somewhat familiar with, one of the more common, one, common ones is seen here. We can use carbon dioxide and then uh, hydrogen sulfide. This is one of the more prominent uh, inorganic uh, molecules that comes out of hydrothermal vents. That has a lot of energy stored in it, and they'll use that to create glucose, water, and then sulfur. Uh, we could also do a very similar one where we're using carbon dioxide, water, and again, hydrogen sulfide to create glucose, and this time H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid. So you don't have to memorize these, but you should be familiar with hydrogen sulfide as one of the ways that we have chemical energy stored, and these producers, these bacteria, release that energy and put it into organic molecules like glucose. Now, when we talk about chemosynthesis and photosynthesis, 
how productive it is is going to affect the rest of the ecosystem. If we're not really doing much, then there's not going to be that much energy and that much organic compounds for the rest of the organisms. So when we talk about productivity, we're talking about how much photosynthesis or chemosynthesis is taking place. So one way to define this is the rate of production of what we call biomass per unit area or volume per year. So when we talk about biomass, we're talking about mass or the amount of something, typically carbon, that's put into bio or living things. So how much carbon is being taken out of the environment and put into living tissue? So the way we can measure this is by simply measuring how much carbon per area per year. So for example, if I were to take a look at this algal bed, this bed of algae that is growing on these rocks in this ecosystem, I could first start off by taking a look at a certain given area. Let's say I'm going to measure a one meter by one meter area. So this is a meter by a meter. And let's say over the course of a year, I measure or determine that the amount of carbon that's being put into them is roughly 1500 grams of carbon. So what I could do is say that the productivity of the system is 1500 grams of carbon, but remember per meter squared, because it was a meter by a meter per year. And then I can shorten this just something to, to get it less wordy is by putting it this way, 1500 grams of carbon. I can use a negative two to say per meter squared and then a negative one exponent to say per year. So it's really the same thing. You can see it either way. So that's how productive it is. Uh, I could also take a look at how much energy is being captured. So another way to measure productivity is how much energy from, let's say, the sun is being put into our producers, again, per unit area or volume per year. So let's say this time, instead of measuring uh, the algae, I'm going to measure the phytoplankton uh, floating around in the upper surface of the ocean. So this time, let's say instead of measuring the amount of uh, carbon, I'm going to measure how, many, how much energy. So a unit of energy could be something called kilojoules. And let's say I determine that 2,000 kilojoules of energy were captured by the producers. Now, over how, what area or what volume? Well, because I'm dealing with water now, I'm not dealing with a fixed area, I'm going to measure in volume, which is going to be meters cubed. So uh, length times width times height. And again, let's say that was over the course of a year. So per year. And again, I can shorten this just to put it as 2000 kilojoules per uh, meter cubed per year. So when we're measuring productivity, you should be familiar with these different units, but all we're really doing is either measuring how much carbon is being put in or how much energy is being captured. The more productive it is, the better it is for the ecosystem. That means more energy and more carbon available to the rest. What are some things that affect productivity? Well, if we go back to the formulas, you got to think about, well, what are my reactants? How much carbon dioxide is available? How much water? Or in the case of uh, chemosynthesis, how much hydrogen sulfide is coming out of that hydrothermal vent? Or in the case of where typically we think of photosynthesis, how much light is available? So one thing I wanted to close off with was when we talk about productivity, one way that we can measure productivity of photosynthetic areas is using something called a secchi disk. Now, the secchi disk is what you see here, and this is going to help measure how turbid the water is. So when we talk about turbidity or turbid, that just means how cloudy is the water. The more turbid, the less uh, available light there's going to be because it's really cloudy and that light can't penetrate. So the way that this device is used is pretty simple. On this rope, we're going to have just a few notches, one notch every meter. So let's say there's a notch here, there's a notch here, there's a notch here. And we have this weighted disc painted white and black. And what will happen is we'll lower that into the water. And we'll keep lowering it, lowering it, keeping track of how many meters we're lowering it. And then when we can't see it anymore, we're going to write down that distance. So let's say this person lowers it into the water and then after 14 meters or 14 notches, it disappears. So we'll write that number down. Then what the person will do is lift up the secchi disc and then when it becomes visible again, we'll write that down. So let's say they lift it up and now it's only 10 meters down. We now have two value, values. We'll just take the average of the two or the mean and if we get 14 and uh, 10, we get 24 divided by two, that would mean that our value is 12 meters. And what we can do is keep coming back to this area throughout the year to measure how turbid the water is. The more turbid it is, the less productive, and therefore that's gonna really affect the rest of the ecosystem. Or the more clear it is, that means that light can really penetrate through and we'd expect it to be more productive, which would mean more biomass and more energy for the rest of the ecosystem. So at this point, these are the three things you should be able to do. Hopefully you're able to explain that photosynthesis, it captures energy of the sun and makes that energy available to the food chain, really understand how. You should be able to explain that chemosynthesis is another process that's going to capture chemical energy like hydrogen sulfide, and they're going to uh, use that energy to make it available to the rest of the food chain. And then finally explain the meaning of the term productivity, this idea about the rate at which we capture energy or, or take that carbon and how that may influence the rest of the food chain. The more productive, the more biomass and energy available to everyone else. If you can do that, you're in great shape. And as always, if not, feel free to go back and rewatch any section. Thanks for watching.